This is a project, this is about the significance of plants to humanity in the 21st century. Why is that different to a 19th century version? And I think it's because, I think we've all become aware that we need to use our land very, very cleverly. Within this piece of land, what we wanted to demonstrate was, yes, we want people to come here and enjoy it. It's recreational, they can take great shaded walks through beautiful gardens and go to a big concert. At the same time, we wanted to make sure that we could manage the water sustainably and sensibly. We wanted to, to have structures in there that were actually reinforcing the environmental story. We wanted a layer in there that was sort of about education, also it could tell stories about the, the cultural significance of plants, the significance of rainforest plants. Typically an architect is working for people and you kind of start to usurp your thoughts on how people will use the building and want to use the building. And I think our team definitively said, or maybe Andrew's, um, it's all about the plants because it is all about the plants. Yes, the people are going to are you know going to enjoy it and all the rest of it, but they're only going to enjoy it if the plants are healthy, healthy and happy. And the client for the project is the National Parks Board of Singapore, and I think probably around about 2000 they started looking at this site because there's actually three pieces. There's the main Bay South area, which is 54 hectares. There's the Bay East, which is another 34 hectares, and the Bay Central, which is another 17 hectares. So about 100 hectares altogether. You know, been given over to, to green space. But what I do absolutely remember is that whole story about bringing these foreign plants in and finding a way in which they could live with, in a mutually beneficial way. There was a really nice discussion about um, the idea that it's a happy, happy combination between the foreign plants and the living plants, the natural plants. And again, Andrew, it's partly your story, but there were some great diagrams at the beginning about how we get a symbiotic relationship between the two. Like all the plants that grow on trees in Singapore, they don't hurt the tree that they grow on, but they're there. And the idea, I think, and I think there are nice analogies between culture and the massive diversity of the culture in Singapore. And right at the competition stage, right, one of the, the fundamental things I wanted to do was explore like a project ecosystem you know what are the relationships between some of the different elements and particularly to find all sorts of ways to, uh, relationships between the buildings and particularly the cool conservatories and the gardens so that whenever we talked about them it was one project it was one system one of the building blocks very important building block was this idea of ethnobotany let's actually understand the relationship between plants and the cultural life of Singapore you know, the Indian, Chinese, Malay, the Western sort of cultures, and every one of those had its own little narratives and stories. What we started to sort of really explore parallel to that, to sort of counterbalance that, was the idea of the rainforest, the Southeast Asian rainforest, and the significance of that in terms of biodiversity. This is the, the Flower Dome, um, the cool, dry conservatory with a collection of Mediterranean plants. This is the um, the cloud forest dome, which is effectively a, a tropical montane cloud forest exhibit. Um, these are the heritage gardens, so you've got Indian, Chinese, Malay and Western, colonial. Uh, these are the world of plants gardens, so you've got secret life of trees, world of palms, understory, fruits and flowers, web of life and discovery. In the middle, which is the main cluster of 12 super trees. This is the super tree grove, which is a sort of a hidden magical world. The meadow down here, which is basically a flexible open space for concerts and just a nice breathing space for, for people to enjoy. The gardens are actually entirely surrounded by water and you basically you cross water to get into the gardens. We talked a lot about, you know, what is the idea that we will hang this on? And, and to a certain extent, we thought, you know, is the, is the orchid too corny? It's the national flower of Singapore. I mean, orchids are very adept at adapting to extraordinary, unusual and harsh conditions. Mm. And, um, you know, they're very efficient with their infrastructure. And once you decide to build yeah. two 12,000 square metre glass conservatories, or they yeah. might have been something about conservatories, then there's a lot of other stuff. They could easily have been separate buildings and they were definitively not. They were part of the landscape, shapes and forms and leaves and petals mm. and patterns. 
because of what Andrew did in terms of his organisational orchid. To turn the typology of a glass house on its head, because the, the, the glass houses of, the, of our <laughs> part of the world, the, the Northern Hemisphere typically, are there to, to keep plants warm. Yes. I mean, you're generally there as a big solar collector to keep plants warm, and of course the issue we have in Singapore is that it's always hot and sticky, so actually we were building an enclosure to keep plants cool. Yeah, actually, if you stand back and say, build two cooled conservatories in the middle of Singapore, I mean, it's madness. In the original competition submission, we decided that we, we were going to dry the air using these things called desiccants, which are, are, are chemicals that dry the air out. And the intention was that the super trees would be clad in lots of solar panels that would then produce the heat to dry the desiccants. When we went to look at some desiccant installations, we found that there were significant problems with um, the sun coming in and out and the sudden huge burst of energy it gave into the systems. And so we were struggling to make the solar power desiccant work. And I had a conversation with the CEO of, the then CEO of N Parks, who was bemoaning the fact that he had to look after these three million trees in Singapore and was producing hundreds of tons of wood waste every day that he didn't quite know what to do with. So at that point, we switched the whole strategy for the gardens. Once we discovered about the huge amounts of bio-waste that was available in Singapore from the National Parks Board, we kind of moved it on to a more sophisticated diagram or a more technical diagram, where we've ended up with um, one of the largest um, biomass boiler plants, I would think, in private use anywhere in the world. It's a 7.5 megawatt boiler plant, which generates steam, which drives a turbine, which makes power, and the waste heat from that turbine goes into two different chiller cycles. Um, and the absorption chiller, which is basically taking heat and generating cooling, is used to drive the conservatories. Um, and then the, the secondary waste heat from that is used as part of a desiccant process to, to regenerate desiccants which are drying the air. We also take solar energy from the glass houses, so the heat that comes into here and heats up the air uh, we t makes the, the air at the top of the glass houses very hot. That gets extracted and drawn back through and is also part of the desiccant regeneration process. So there's a, there's a cycle going on here in terms of um, desiccants and drying. There's a cycle in terms of vegetation. All of the waste and the waste ash from the, um, the, the burning, wood burning process, going right back to the very first diagrams, becomes part of the fertilizer system. Um, so we have two levels of organic fertilizer waste that go out. One goes into the gardens and one goes off site to be mixed for, as part of a cement production process. We often get asked the question, why would you build a, a glass house and then put so much shading on the outside of it? And it's all really rooted in the fact that the plants need light. And the plants can grow well when they receive something like 45,000 lux of light level for more than 500 hours a year. So 450 lux would be a right level for an office space. We basically had to set the, set the facade up of the building so it could deal with the extent, long, long hours of cloudy weather. Um, and in that, in that period, we have the shades out of the way and the glass is, doing, is letting as much light as it can onto the plants. Once the sun comes out, you get the full tropical heat, something like 1,100 watts, 1.1 kilowatts per square meter of glass. We need to try and filter out the heat, let the light through, and then at a certain point, we just have more heat than a, the air conditioning system can cope with. At that point, we deploy the shades to prevent the direct solar game getting in and, and um, either uh, damaging the plants through too much heat, too much energy, um, but also to provide um, oases for people um, inside the space. So the shades on the outside also prevent you from sitting, having to stand in direct sunshine. So it's just like if you're sitting in a, outside in a terrace, you go and sit under the umbrella to get out of direct sunshine. In essence, it's a responsive skin, a responsive because the climate is changing. Once you've decided you're having a shading system, then what you do is fight to get the least amount of structure or the least amount of surface in the way of the light to get to the plants. Now, grid shells are fantastic structures to span very large areas because they work on the basis of shells. Very thin surfaces using double curvature to give them stiffness. Um, the problem that you get on the scale of the thing we're talking about here, and we're talking about 120, 130 metres span, is to keep the grid shell as light as possible. It's very, very, very good at supporting its own weight as a three-dimensional surface. Um, and so, and in that condition, you, you, you get the curvature of the thing providing its own support. But the minute you blow wind at it, sideways, it buckles. So we had to find a system that combined two structural ideas together to give you the lightness of the grid shell, but the stiffness of a structure capable of supporting both its weight and the wind. Mm. And we came up with this idea of these series of arches which span across the grid shell. To deliver the idea of perpetual spring, which was the environmental brief that they could fool the plants into replete flowering, 
by dropping the temperature significantly. Creating the unique problem to these conservatories, which no other building would have in Singapore, or in fact anywhere else, where you working in temperatures in the day in the, in, on the equator of upwards of 50 degrees in the day, and we had to drop it down at night time for this ignition temperature of the plants, which creates this enormous temperature difference and then a piece of steel 130 metres long expands and contracts enormously. What the, the skin does is it gives us about 65% of the incident daylight comes through as visible light, but only about 35% of the infrared energy, which is the, uh, the heat energy, comes through the outer skins. We realised that actually it was always warm at the top yeah. because the place that the cool was happening was at the lower point. Because of stratification, it works wonderfully. The shape of the structure, the shape of the garden, with the kind of terrace, allowed the cool air to tumble in and to work well at the bottom. Any of the familiar models of conservatory, you throw open the windows on a sunny day, or on a hot day, and they ventilate. And on a winter day, you shut the windows and you, turn, you crank up the radiators. Not too complicated. Here we had a whole much more complex situation with, with radiation, radiative heat exchange, with, with human comfort with um, getting the right amount of air movement. I'm sure these people aren't so aware of it, but there's a big, a whole lot of environmental things going on right here where the, the, these people are walking on a, the concrete paths which have um, a, a whole net of pipes. Normally, they would heat up and re-radiate, but we actually take the energy away, the heat energy away through cool water running through the, through the paths. The joyous thing, of course, is that once you've decided that the cold air ponds... Stratifies. ...lays at the bottom, stratifies, the really perverse thing is then to put a mount in it, which would typically expect to get colder as you go up. So we then had an interesting debate as to how to keep the mountain cold at the top once we'd broken into the layers of, mm. of gradual heat. But it's the whole idea that the mountain is not just um, a big mound of earth, it's a whole building. We couldn't get the air humid enough just by pumping in moist air, so we have, there are misters at the top, which are very much like a, a misty morning on a in a tropical rainforest and it's absolutely magical when you go up there just this great sort of foggy um, uh, foggy moistness in the air which is just fantastic to walk through and experience. The sandwich between the structure and the envelope and all of this sort of uh, handling stuff beneath it and structures and all sort of things is, is the zone where there's plants and there are people sort of yes. inhabiting. So how do you showcase them? How do you actually deal with you know several million visitors a year you know, in the, the flower dome, the idea is actually to treat it almost like a theatre. You go in, you know, there's a spectacle, there's a big sort of auditorium in a way, and then you, you find your way through. Um, and in the cloud forest dome, you basically, you have a much more immersive three-dimensional experience. You take to the top of the, the mountain and then come through it. The cloud mountain I'm, is almost like galleries, it's sort of multimedia galleries that can be programmed in different ways, you can use it in different ways. So to deliver all of these ideas and these things, these functions, you know, we've had to rethink the idea of the conservatory and how that fits into a 21st century public garden. You know, one of the starting points for thinking about super trees was tropical vertical gardens. I mean, Bernard Marx, a long time ago, started using sort of bromeliads and some of the epiphytic plants of a, for a rainforest in a vertical way. Uh, we just thought we could push it a little bit harder and sort of really make something of a, a real scale. Because the scale of these is really significant. We wanted something right at the heart of the garden that actually would work, complement the conservatories, but work in the scale of the city. It's a sort of an emerging sort of idea that actually we can learn a lot about how to develop in 21st century urban developments from natural processes. You know, that was one of the sort of underpinning ideas for the, what became the super tree. It wasn't called that style, where it was just, you know, the idea of this sort of fantastic vertical form where we could showcase um, tropical plants on a scale, vertical scale, that hadn't been seen before. How does, how does one create a structure, an infrastructure onto which you can build vertical gardens? Well, we had the chimneys. They, kind of been, they need to be relatively strong themselves to stand up in the wind. What evolved was the idea of a skin on the outside of this um, chimney to perhaps hide the fact that it is a chimney, make it more beautiful, and use it to the, the benefit of having that stiff structure and support the gardens up it. What was a kind of thin core developed into an extended canopy. The canopy is, a, is, a, is the upside down version of a membrane structure, conical surface in membranes, which is 
three-dimensional, i.e. opposed curvature, but unlike the conservatories, which is synclastic, yeah, the curvature is opposite, so you, it was, which is anticlastic. This climate for, for engineers and for designers to throw up their hands is a sense of almost hopelessness. That you think, well, this, is, this climate is so tough to work in that there's nothing you can do about it. That you, you, kind of, you kind of think, what, how on earth do you com compete with what nature is throwing at you in terms of sunlight, humidity, moisture, rain, all those things. And I think that this, the kind of, the, it's all about possibilities. Singaporeans who can experience effectively, because they are so big, 12,000 square metres, of being outside at 20 degrees. Yeah. There are ways that you can deal with these issues that don't cost the earth, that don't demand huge amounts of energy consumption to want to make them happen. But what's so great about this project is we were given the opportunity and the, the tools in some ways through a great client who, who let us take these things a, lot, a very long way to build something that you know, actually says to, to Singapore, it's not just about a consumptive lifestyle, you can actually make a regenerative lifestyle and a restorative lifestyle. Perhaps surprising for us as well, I mean it's showing us about how differently people can, can think about using spaces both during the day and during at night and sort of refreshing, renewing an idea about how you use public space. I think the, the really great thing about this is that there is so much emotional response here. The, the, the trees are super trees, the nature is super nature, it is all slightly exaggerated, which gives people the opportunity and allows people to see things in a new way. Jabal Hafid is um, it's a wonderful landmark of, of the area because you have the desert plain. It's in the heartland of Abu Dhabi. I think what's really interesting about Abu Dhabi and, and Dubai, uh, that whole region, is in a very short period of time, w within the last 50 years, um, of people who were very connected with their landscape had lost that connection because of the, the oil wealth. Um, they were now living in you know, high-rise cities, uh, separated from their landscape. And so I think it was really important from our client's perspective to cr create that connection again. The current situation, as you find it on uh, the site, is a fantastic mountain, which is um, in the m movement of um, any rain clouds that come from the Indian Ocean and can catch the rain and move it into the plain. Um, then there's the, the, the rocky plain, which is cut in several places by wadi formations that fan out into the rest of the desert in this large agricultural valley. Um, that, those wadis are stopped by a large sand bank. Within the context of rethinking and renewing, when we first approached the project, it's very different from a normal architectural or landscape uh, project because it was really about um, protecting the site and restoring the site. So what we have is a large tract of land that is cut off from the rest of the world by this big sandbank that, that allows us to sort of go back and sort of rework um, the, the landscape to become a little uh, as it was before man arrived and uh, basically farmed the, the site. It takes a, a sort of knowing eye to understand the problems of that landscape. And um, when we first started, um, we knew that we needed the help of other specialist consultants. We also put together a team of specialists from uh, America, desert specialists who had been involved in desert restoration there. It's not like your <coughs> traditional architectural project where you can script something and write a plan. It was very much about process and the whole challenge of restoring the desert was really about how you do it without destroying it even more. You obviously um, were a very important member of the team. Uh, Phil and Shahina uh, have come to it with their botanical and horticultural knowledge. The biggest challenge that we had was how to restore this area 
because that was the whole idea behind the creation of this park, was to make it look as natural as possible. Because the whole area was trashed, it was completely uh, farmland, it was very badly grazed. There's a, a desert plain, you already know it's a, um, a habitat that's very fragile. Obviously this part of, of the, the, the area is uh, quite significant and quite species rich as compared to the other parts. Just across from the border, you know, there's a border fencing between uh, Oman and, uh, and Abu Dhabi. You see the, the species composition over there and we actually for this we used that as a landmark. It gave us a sort of a visual image of what could be achieved. We, we thought that if we were to plant a similar species over there, some of it will come back uh, naturally with rain. Some of, of course will have to be given a boost with irrigation, but uh, I mean the whole idea was to, to leave it after some time and let the species get, you know, sort of hold of themselves and uh, recreate this uh, kind of ecosystem that was completely lost. I think that was the approach that was really exciting about this project as well, is that we weren't setting up a landscape that would have to be maintained in the same way over many, yeah. many years. The idea was that we would set up something that eventually would sustain itself. It was also important that one could return to the uh, existing original landscape because there were so many other stories mm -hmm. that existed that overlaid the site about um, the Bronze Age, um, the archaeology, uh, the Bedouin and their movements across mm -hmm. this landscape over time. Um, if, if, if we hadn't had the chance to restore the landscape itself, those stories wouldn't have been so rich. So that has been a very special place, not only physically um, in terms of allowing the different plants to grow, but also culturally. Um, so that significance really brought together the cultural and the natural. The size was vast. The shock of seeing the site was one thing, but then as we got near the, the Hafi, it was quite noticeable, even, even though the plants that weren't, weren't as heavily grazed, there was good signs of growth on them, which was quite surprising. But away from the mountains, you got nearer the road, it was sort of like common land, wasn't it? With, with mm -hmm. just anybody doing whatever they wanted by the look of it and driving over everything and compaction for if you're trying to rest, restore land compaction is a huge problem again the scale of the restoration of, it, of getting the soil to to accept plant communities back again was going to be a huge problem well there were two two um let's see techniques that we were trying to, to work out um, so we had the decompaction which was about decompacting the farm areas and then there was also the reconstruction of the wadis which wasn't um, only about reconstructing the primary course of water but understanding that um, across the whole field we were trying to stop the water flow um, from going so quickly and washing off taking off all the soil with it we tried out different techniques of um, decompaction using different machines, um, going to different depths and moving at different rates. So we prepared um, a number of heavy equipment vehicles to be out there. So we brought everyone out on site and tested different areas to understand not only what needs to be done, but also um, the rate it could be carried out. I mean, the wadis had been disrupted by vehicle routes mm. and, and dumping and all sorts of things. So we had to restore that movement of water mm. through the landscape. And not through just one channel, but really trying to understand how it fans out over a plane. The, with the end of the uh, soil restoration, which we term the physical restoration of the site, comes the biological restoration. You cannot recreate the entire ecosystem, but what you can do is you target the dominant species, the main species that are there, like a major shrub or a major tree, and plant that, and then the other species live underneath that. Well, we had a combination of different surveys, didn't we? Yes, we, we, we did, Jen. Of course, uh, with, with uh, a couple of two members of my team, we came over just to have a complete uh, sort of a vegetation survey. You know, every sort of 500 meters, we would, we would stop and survey the vegetation that was there, like what are all, all the species which are growing, uh, the numbers as well, so that that could, that could be used when we were thinking of reconstructing the whole uh, or restoring the landscape. At the end of our analysis, we knew exactly what species were present in the plain mm -hmm. and what was the composition of the species that were found on the ridges and those which were found in the wadis at different depths. The biggest dilemma of, of the site at this scale is actually understanding it and knowing it really well. So it was very important having 
got hold of these 1968 um, aerial photos to f have similar um, aerial photos uh, of the, the present situation. Okay, so what was exciting about the um about mapping this site of, of such a size is bringing together really um, a systematic understanding of topography with the on the ground information that was gathered. Then Q's GIS team uh, created this model, a very detailed model down to a resolution of one meter by one meter across the entire site, which was then used in the analysis. So that was really just the, the basis of analysis that gave us the topography. Um, on which we then overlaid the um, imagery that showed the vegetation in different conditions of today and also from 1968. Now, if I want to plant something uh, in, in, in the gravel plain and the site, that particular square meter doesn't allow me to do that because I have all the information with that, we can move it. In a desert, the conditions are very harsh. So you have to plant a community of uh, uh, plants. And that's what uh, we, we started doing in collection and uh, in our trials as well. well there, there was a couple of practices we wanted to try, and especially with some of the grasses, we thought it'd be worth trying to transplant them. Um, and we had a very short period of time to try and uh, do a, a five trial plots to see how, it, how, how our plants would grow. Bear in mind that desert plants are fairly easy to grow. And if you just give them, which is what we were going to do, give them some mm -hmm. water, uh, they, they responded very quickly. And the conclusion of that, we went back oh, it was about six months later and the, the growth on some of them was just amazing. Mm -hmm. But it just proved that the transplants, they, they could survive, but they didn't look good. And the, all the new sort of 90 centimetre whips that we bought that were natural grown seed were romping away. What, what we never got to do was link these trial plots with the real condition mm. in the, the desert and understanding, mm. Mm. as you said, mm. whether that, that terrain we were about to move into was going to be able to sustain those plants beyond the watering. I mean, I think mm. that's, that was the real secret to whether this was going to work or not. Mm. And, um, hopefully very soon we, we get that chance. The whole process of, um, of repopulating the desert is something that would be of interest to um, the general public, school children. It was, it's a big attractor to, um, to the site, but there's a much bigger strategy which involves you know, a, a much larger visitor centre and, and, and a much wider visitor experience. I mean, from uh, the perspective of our client, ADACH, uh, their original reasons for bringing us to, to the project was the restoration and the interest um, of uh, the, the archaeology on the site. And so the, the stories about the archaeology, the geology of the mountain, um, how um, this landscape had evolved um, over time, um, was laid, uh, overlaid with this new situation where we were res restoring it. Um, when visitors came to the site for the first time, they were going to see all this activity. You know, wh wh why were these plants sort of being sort of moved into the desert, and um, why have you got a nursery, and why why have you removed the farms? All these sort of questions had to be sort of answered and, and given a storyline, and that we thought was a really important starting point for any visitors. Then the the next dilemma was was how to bring people into the desert and how to create bases to see the most interesting aspects and parts of it. So we created a series of trails and three satellites. Uh, there were two um, next to the mountain and a third at the nursery so they could understand the, the process of restoration. The tomb satellite was very much linked to the archaeology and how man had used this uh, site uh, for um, movement, um, shade, um, burial, the White Wadi satellite. That was actually a very beautiful sort of enclosed natural landscape with flora and fauna. And then the third was about the restoration. And all, all these storylines were brought together in the main uh, visitor centre. So this acclimatization space was the sort of starting point for your adventure in the desert. Um, so a bus would come uh, every so often, pick people up, and take them off to the, the satellites where um, they would then, in effect, use those spaces as starting points for trails. We specifically located them in places where they weren't seen from 
uh, the environment in which people were being led. Um, and they would, but they would have a sort of sense of the, the vastness of the, the landscape that uh, was about to be explored. What this project has really brought out most in me is, uh, is an understanding of the desert. So that whole process or understanding was for me, I think, very, very important. And we very much hope that the restoration project uh, of uh, the Mazia Desert Park can be used as a model for restoration of desert landscapes in hyper-arid areas. But what is particularly special about this site is the extreme conditions that we had to meet when we got there. Then rethinking that design process where we normally go from planning to design procurement and then handing it over, um, to really think about how we would create a landscape that has to live beyond us. I'm Ralph Johnson with Perkins & Will Architects in Chicago. I'm the National Director of Design and I'm here to talk about the Kenya Women's and Children's Wellness Center in Nairobi, Kenya. It really started with the client. The client uh, is the James R. Jordan Foundation out of Chicago and uh, we worked with Dolores Jordan, uh, mother of Michael Jordan. The population of, uh, of Kenya is, is well underserved in terms of its health care needs and she got interested in the idea of helping to, to do something about this. The renewal aspect of the project is programmatically about what Mrs. Jordan had in mind, but it's also architecturally a renewal of the typology of hospitals and a rethink of uh, how we deliver health care. Mrs. Jordan came up with a program which consisted of uh, a, basically a hospital, a traditional hospital of 170 beds with diagnostic uh, treatment facilities. Uh, outpatient facilities as part of the main hospital, but also a gender, gender violence recovery center, uh, an education uh, center, and teaching center. There's also a, a hostel where families can stay if their uh, relatives are being uh, uh, treated in the hospital. So it's really a, a, a total holistic view of medicine uh, in, the, in the program. The site is located on the outskirts of Nairobi next to the American uh, International University uh, where Mrs. Jordan acquired a very interesting piece of property, very long and narrow, uh, stepping down a, a hillside uh, with a 30 meter difference between upper and lower site. We had to change the typology of, of uh, the hospital and how we think of the hospital by creating it more as a series of, of smaller scale pavilions that step down the hill. The Gender Violence Recovery Center then is located below the hospital in the lower element of the site in a more secluded area along with the hospital where families will stay. We didn't want the building to appear massive, so we took those facilities, which also need to be air conditioned, put those under the ground, the surgery, radiology, the laboratories, etc. The diagnostic and treatment facilities, which are the high-tech areas of the hospital, which also have to be very compact and have very short circulation distances, are located below grade in a plinth. And then put the things above, such as the beds and the various uh, teaching facilities and offices that could be cross-ventilated in a series of narrow uh, pavilion-like bars to create a sense of, of the scale of the surrounding uh, community. So all you see are these thinner bars which create the village effect. That's where the rethink part of the process comes in for us. It was to, for us to rethink the idea of a traditional hospital, which people have in their minds massive uh, technologically oriented facilities. Uh, architecture, which is very much in scale with its surroundings, but pr providing a kind of global, uh, highly technical uh, elements of a hospital without producing a kind of intimidation factor. It's a totally different hospital than any of the other hospitals we've designed. Because the Kenyan society is a group-oriented society, it really drives the typology of the hospital. What drives a Western typology is having things as close together as possible, which drives massive uh, uh, tight floor plates and, and big buildings. We, we gave up some of the circulation affinities that you have in a Western hospital, spread things out, but what we gain is uh, the natural ventilation, the uh, 
the daylighting and the exterior spaces, which are very much also a part of the treatment process. The hospital is surrounded by uh, smaller tribal villages, and people tend to relate to each other in, in, uh, in groups rather than in the individuals. Uh, so we wanted to create uh, a sense of community. So the basic architectural typology of the non-air conditioned elements are very thin, single loaded, east-west uh, oriented bars for the very long north-south facades for two reasons. One is uh, solar control, uh, daylighting, as well as picking up the breezes of Kenya. The climate of Nairobi is very, very benign. It's about 22 degrees centigrade all year round. It's very high elevation. So the idea of, uh, of cross-ventilated, naturally ventilated bars works very well in this climate. The roofs of the, of the uh, bars actually are, uh, cover courtyards as well. They extend over courtyards and tie the bars together, forming uh, shaded courtyard spaces that are uh, gathering areas which also fulfill the mission of the hospital. It's areas where people can get together in groups, exchange ideas, that learning can occur in those exterior areas as well as the interior areas of the hospital. Community members can come in, use the space, exchange ideas, which are part of the uh, preventative uh, and holistic view of medicine. The construction methods of the hospital are kept very uh, simple and basic uh, using both natural materials, the stone base of the facility, as well as uh, very simple flat plate concrete construction and uh, simple infill elements uh, for the windows as well as the screening elements uh, to keep the building as, as low maintenance as possible. So I think as an approach to healthcare, I think it's an interesting prototype. For me, uh, being involved in this project, uh, and it makes me think about how we approach Western healthcare and whether we can have he healthcare environments become much more part of their natural environment. But I think we need to look at the hospitals we're doing, which are mainly driven by function and cost and think about the humanistic aspects, which I think this project uh, for me helped was a rethink for my own process about how I think about healthcare.